For over 15 years, the New Zealand government has been systematically dropping massive amounts of food laced with a cruel and universally toxic poison into its forest ecosystems. Enough poison every year to kill the entire population of New Zealand four times over. No other country is doing or ever has done anything remotely similar on such a scale. This film examines this extraordinary practice, its rationalization and its human and ecological consequences. New Zealand is a tourist mecca, visually spectacular, a photographer's paradise, a wildlife wilderness, an adventure playground, home to the intriguing kiwi bird, an ecological wonderland in any other place on earth, perhaps. But is there a darker side to our clean, green, 100% pure image? I suppose our upbringing was somewhat unusual. We were raised in the back country of the central North Island, the Urawera National Park. Our father was a commercial hunter. His occupation for 30 odd years involved hunting wild deer and carrying them out on his back. There was no money paid until the complete carcass in one piece was delivered to the meat buyers. Life for our mother raising five kids in the wilderness was a lonely and trying existence. However, she stuck it out and endured the primitive lifestyle for which we are all forever grateful. We were happy kids with lots of exciting activities to pursue. Of course life in the bush was just one big wild adventure. Over the years our passion for the outdoors and wildlife only grew stronger. Most of our time in the bush these days is spent on still photography and videography. As time went by we like many others grew more and more concerned at the ever increasing use of 1080 poison in New Zealand. 1080 is used to control introduced possums and other wild animals. We also found that the wider community are largely oblivious to what's going on. So what is 1080 poison? 1080 is an alias for uh, monofluoral acetate, a chemical. It uh, blocks uh, a particular step in the Krebs cycle, which is essential for the metabolism of oxygen in every cell of every animal. It kills everything that breathes air, uh, everything from earthworms to elephants, including native birds. The World Health Organization classifies 1080 as extremely hazardous. Most countries ban it outright. Two forms of poison bait are used in aerial operations in New Zealand. The cereal pellets constitute carbohydrate and protein and are laced with poison. The second form of bait is carrot pieces. Carrots are delivered to the operation site in their complete raw form. They are then processed on site into chunks. The carrots are then applied with poison and a green coloured dye. The poison carrots are then loaded into the hoppers and flown by helicopter or fixed wing to the treatment area for broadcasting. <music> 1080 poison is used to kill introduced mammals. The Australian brush-tailed possum is one of the primary targets and covers most of New Zealand. They were first introduced over 150 years ago to establish a fur trade. Rats are the other primary target of aerial pest control operations in New Zealand. Bush rats have been present in New Zealand bush for over 700 years. New Zealand uses 85% of the world's supply. I'm not sure what that means, but I, I guess the rest of the world hasn't figured out what a wonderful thing it really is. There are three authoritative bodies that aerially spread poisons across New Zealand. The Department of Conservation, the Animal Health Board and Regional Councils. New Zealand drops into its forests about 4,000 kilos of pure 1080 per year, enough to kill 20 million people. On a per acre basis, this is 350 times more 1080 than Australia and 22,000 times the rest of the world. And the more they use, the more frustrated the public are becoming. And in some cases, some individuals are going to great lengths to voice their concerns. These people have been fighting 1080 poison for over a decade and it's an uphill battle. Well, they're going to be dropping 1080 in two weeks, probably two weeks around here. There's been no consultation whatsoever. 
We know what Tinati does to the animals, it's a very, very agonising death. So we've come down here with our carrots as a symbol of the Tinati drops. But carrots weren't all the protesters had to offer. They also brought a bag of dead birds. Casualties, they say, of an aerial drop in Turangi two years ago. That's one you reckon you don't get. Apart from all the reasons not to use this stuff, they just blatantly ignore the most profoundly obvious of all, just how cruel this stuff is and how long it takes to kill an animal. One horse was actually found in the paddock, um, dead up, up against the pine trees, had obviously been thrashing around for quite some time, had a lot of mucus, it almost looked like its lungs had blown out of its face. Another horse was also found in that same paddock um, under a pine tree and of course the fourth horse to die was Bullet and she died in the paddock behind us in town. They don't want to eat, they lose all body coordination, they actually have trouble even standing. The veins in their bodies basically pop out all over the place, uh, their gums go completely white like a shock. You can see that the animals are so distressed there is absolutely nothing that you can do to help them. The vitamins we were giving, we were giving via a syringe mixed with water and it was all it entailed was putting that into the mouth and all they needed to do was swallow. Um, she even lost the ability to be able to do that. But three days of watching her agonise and get worse and worse um, to still come to that horrible demise. And there's more animals than possums and dogs that, that become affected by it and will die horribly from it. On the Friday there was an aerial drop of 1080 along the, along the ridge line. On the Sunday I had quite a frantic call from my mother um, telling me that the red cow was dead and then she came um, came back and found the, her, her daughter and brought her up and she wasn't well. The first cow died on the on the Sunday and then on the Monday I called at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock to, to have that, that cow autopsied and I also had the second sick cow up here in the yards. She'd gone from being reasonably bad to bloody terrible. She couldn't stand, she was fighting to kind of keep herself together, so I stayed out of the yard and stayed on the outside and then I called my brother to get the rifle. The drop was Friday, the Wednesday I came out and I actually witnessed um, one of last year's fawns dying and it's the most horrific death I have ever witnessed on any poor animal. It was cruel. 1080 does fucking dear. The first thing I noticed she had the shakes, her head was going like this and her eyes were bulging. Eventually she was staggering around, she went down, she went into like a rigor mortis, everything went tense and she was screaming in agony and then she would soften up and then she'd thrash around and she was screaming and then she'd tense up again and it carried on for about three quarters of an hour and eventually she died. But that had been a long time coming, that was the last stages of her life and it was hideous. Approximately 20,000 deer are killed annually by 1080 drops. The deer kill rate per 1080 drop is about 50%. I myself have been involved with eight dogs that have been lost over the years. It is pretty horrific what you see these dogs go through. And regardless of whether you've got muzzles or whatever, there is still going to be dogs right throughout the country lost on farms. That's just the on-farm dogs without any of the other pet dogs or anything else around. It is horrific and we're expected to work right in the middle of all this stuff. Once the signs of poisoning start, they become hyperactive and run and snap and bite. They lose control of their bowels and their bladder. They experience twitching of their muscles, often facial muscles. Then the spasms of the muscles become more severe and they develop very strong spasms of muscles in their legs and tail that make all of their limbs and tail very stiff. 
Dogs might die during fitting, but often there are repeated fits with periods where they recover in between. There's a two hour period of symptoms before they die. You can kill over two and a half thousand 25 kilogram dogs with the amount of tear 80 uh, that uh, is usually put on a hectare. Two and a half thousand dogs. 1080 is not a humane poison and despite people's claims that it is humane, we now recognise that that's not the case. It's not good enough to pretend to ourselves that it's humane and keep on doing the same old thing that we've been doing for years. There's no excuse to keep on using a poison that is not humane and that we know is not humane. When I was on the faculty at the University of California uh, in uh, medicine and medical information science, I, uh, which is probably the most important part of this, is I specialized in uh, the design and evaluation of uh, scientific re research. Basically, to how you go about telling when uh, a piece of science is worth paying attention to. So in a way, uh, we were perhaps uniquely qualified to undertake this project. And we spent almost six months going through the scientific literature and writing a 100-page, uh, fully referenced, highly detailed appraisal of what the scientists actually showed about the uh, benefits and harm being done uh, by this extraordinary practice. The study that we did resulted in some results that were really hard for us to believe and they were shocking and they were actually disturbing because the Department of Conservation is supposed to engender trust and yet what we found was that they had badly violated the public's trust. DOC's research states that most New Zealand forest dwelling birds are vulnerable to 1080 poison either by eating baits directly or through secondary poisoning. The evidence is overwhelming that uh, Ariel 1080 is killing um, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of birds. The species involved uh, are extensive. They include the robins, the tomtits, the weka, the uh, moorpork, the kia, the list goes on and on. We compiled the numbers on this uh, based on Doc's uh, own evidence, the uh, documented cases where they looked at uh, populations after 1080 drops and either had uh, well-documented counts or radio-tagged birds. This is a, a small percentage of the drops, but you can put these data together and come to some fairly firm conclusions. Those conclusions are devastating. They're profoundly disturbing. The numbers vary from 3% to 30% uh, of populations, depending on species, per drop. And these drops are happening every two to three years. You'd call this decimation, except that the word decimation means killing only one in 10. One in 10 would be a good day for the tomtits, uh, as they generally seem to hit about 30%. One in, one in ten would be a good day for kias, as the evidence indicates that they're killing almost 25% there. So decimation is not the appropriate word to describe what Doc is doing to these native species. The situation could be worse. If you look at the 95% confidence intervals, it could be as much as from 20 to 50% of the species we know about, and many species just haven't been studied at all. When pushed into a corner, they admit that birds uh, do die, but they defend the practice by uh, saying that the populations are made up because of decreased predation by feral mammals. Now, that would be good if they had evidence that that were the case, then I would say what they're doing is, at least with regard to the birds, the particular species, is uh, a perfectly rational thing to do. 
but they have no evidence that, uh, that the birds make up their populations. They have no evidence of benefit to any native species. No competent scientific study shows a benefit to any species of native birds. So Doc's rationalization on this is um, propaganda. I'm glad I'm not the one that has to defend this carnage. In 2008, someone in the Department of Conservation leaked an internal report to the Dominion Post. This internal report acknowledged the death of seven of 17 Kias on the Fox Glacier due to aerial 1080 poisoning. The feathered falls of New Zealand's forests and mountains are falling victim to the very poison that's supposed to protect them. Seven West Coast Kia have died since May. Six of them had ingested recently dropped 1080 poison. We've combined that with the numbers from the other tag Kia and uh, have calculated the estimated death rate uh, per drop for Kias. It's around 25% with a confidence interval that goes from oh, 13 or 14 up to about uh, 40. The Conservation Department admits it's done little direct research into the effect of 1080 on Kia numbers, but some believe these alpine entertainers are being wiped out in the high country by the very department that's supposed to be protecting them. One of the things that this suggests is the extent uh, to which uh, Doc is withholding this information. This report about the Kias would never hit the light of day had there not been a whistleblower. How did Doc respond? They did not apologize for the deaths. What they did do is they claimed that 40% of fledgling uh, Kias are killed by possums. There is no evidence to that effect in the scientific literature. I'm highly skeptical that they have evidence that 40% of Kia fledglings are killed by possums. Now, if they've got it, by all means, they should trot it out right away. The issue is that there is no evidence that the Kia population is being benefited by this practice. You have to have bottom line evidence that the population is being benefited. Not that the fledglings are being benefited, or that they, they are being preyed on by possums, or not being preyed on possums. The question is, what is Aerial 1080 doing to this population? Now, it's going to take some extraordinary breeding and some extraordinary possum results to make up for 25% loss every three years due to dock drops. Weka are endemic to New Zealand and are part of the rail family. Weka are opportunists and scavengers. They eat insects, bush fruit, rats and mice and carrion. Everybody's been led to believe that, that 1080 doesn't kill Weka. But while I was tramping the Copeland Valley, I picked up a Weka on the side of the track. So I carted it out, gave it to the Department of Conservation and Fox Glacier to be autopsied. And the end result was that it was found to have been killed by 1080. Bird species are actually quite susceptible to 1080. And in fact, both weckers and ducks have been measured by, uh, uh, by seeing just how much 1080 actually kills them. And the amount of 1080 we put on a hectare would, would be more than enough to kill 500 weckers with the amount of 1080 cereal bait that you put on a hectare. So enormous killing power out there. OK, here's a great example of how our wild creatures and birds are being slaughtered by 1080. Here's a dead possum, possibly poisoned, that the weckers are coming along and, and devouring in great amounts. In the name of conservation, let's just dump it all over the forest. Weka, we can afford to lose them. What else can we afford to lose? You could wipe out Weka, for example, in just one drop, perhaps, because they like to pick on bits and pieces like this. 
In the paper, Secondary Risks from 1080 in Carcasses, the authors state while talking about Bradificum poisoning, for example, the entire western Waka population of Tawhitinui Island was exterminated by eating baits or dead or dying rats. It's not only the baits we have to be concerned about in the forest, but this particular drop took place four months ago. Now the cool-off period used to be three months, I think they've just increased it to six months in a lot of areas, but this particular carcass here is still fairly intact, and I dare say that in another couple of months there'll still be some of it left, and it's still toxic for that whole period. Now if a dog or any other creature, a bird starts pecking at it, anything like that, I dare say they're going to suffer the same fate. Once the poison is ingested by an animal, it is then retained in the carcass of that animal and is then capable of poisoning the next feeder down the food chain, whether that feeder be an insect, bird, animal or even a human. In areas where there's been repeated aerial drops, we've noticed that obvious reduction in moor pork, our only native owl. So I've decided to go and visit one of New Zealand's leading experts on moor pork to see what he's got to say. I've seen huge effects, and I don't mean small, but huge effects uh, of 1080 upon the moorpork. They do take hold of anything, they're scavengers, anything that's small. We feed the owls out in the bush on mice. In fact, I've found dead um, rats and I've even found a dead small baby stoat in an owl hide. If there's no 1080 drops or before 1080 drops started, I might get three or four birds handed in a year. Uh, once the 1080s drop started, can be 16 or 17 times. And so my concern is because the owl takes so long to reproduce numbers, uh, we could see the end of the species in certain areas of our country. Another danger facing the bird life in New Zealand is that what they're feeding their young may be poisonous and even killing their offspring. Now it doesn't just stop with the carrion, it could be insects or even the larger birds taking whole baits back to the nest. The effects of poisoning are very similar in birds to other animals as well. When birds are poisoned, they become quiet, they ruffle up their feathers, they drool and have difficulty breathing, they become clumsy and uncoordinated, they start to have twitching of their muscles and convulsions where their limbs become very stiff and their backs curve back, and then they have fits and they die. How long it takes a bird to die from 1080 is going to depend on the individual bird. One bird will differ from another. It's going to depend on how much poison they ate as well. So it's very hard to predict exactly how long a bird would have symptoms for. But in general, it's fair to say that a poisoned bird will have symptoms of 1080 poisoning for somewhere between hours and days. Many New Zealand birds are vulnerable to secondary poisoning. This occurs when the bird consumes insects or the carrion of an animal that was poisoned or killed by 1080. Because there is no control over how much poison an animal ingests, animals that die contain varying amounts of poison in their carcass. The next feeder down the food chain then may receive either a sublethal or lethal dose of poison. Birds and animals that do recover from sublethal poisoning may be left with long-term disability or diminished breeding capability. You take the uh, ramen study. It went on for three years, and uh, what they showed was that a substantial portion of the robins died as a consequence of this. However, this being one of the few studies that looked at all three variables, death, fledgling success, and population success, 
no change in the population. So robins were killed. There was a slight increase in fledgling success, but it did not translate into population success. And yet Doc habitually cites this as proof that tanity benefits robins, when we know, in fact, what it does is kill robins. Looks like a tomtit. Pretty little guy, isn't he? The specific issue of tomtit deaths and low dosage baits was addressed in Westerbrook, by Westerbrook in uh, 2005. What they found was that if they reduced the dose of cereal bellies uh, low enough, they, uh, they did dramatically reduce the, the death of tomtits. However, when they reduced the amount of uh, 1080 in carrot baits to even very low levels, they still killed up to 50% of uh, tomtits. As we found out through an OIA, Doc is still using um, large quantities of, of, of carrot baits, both medium and low dose carrot baits in their drops. Yeah, they don't deny it. And in fact, Irma uh, authorized a, a dosage almost 10 times higher than the one that still killed 50% of uh, tomtits. Uh, in addition to all that, uh, we have a report from a doc scientist, Claire Veltman, in which she concluded that the uh, low bait strategy was not working. She did uh, comment, however, that they uh, presume that the uh, deaths were compensated by increased uh, breeding success and that eventually the tomtits made it up. There's no proof of that. And they referred to the Robin study. Right. But the Robin study didn't benefit the population. So it's, it's sort of a circular reference situation where one references the other bad study or non-consequential study, and uh, it's a self-reinforcing rumor, effectively. Right. That's what happens. And then Forrest and Birds gets involved, and they pick up what Doc says the study shows and don't actually go and look at the study and amplify the whole process either. Pretty soon you've got the whole population of New Zealand believing what is an absolute falsehood. Uh, consider for example the 2003 uh, Weranaki Forest study in which they looked at caribou, the wood pigeon, and kaka. As usual the elements of good scientific research design were missing. They studied fledgling success, but even then, they actually combined the results from the control and the study group, and that was the only thing they reported. They went on in the abstract section to claim that the study had worked, not because they had shown that it worked, but because it had been shown to work at Motato in 2004. In that study, they looked at a total of 12 species of both native and feral birds. But there was only one randomized control area which was demonstrably completely different from the treated area. So uh, right from the start the results were invalidated. The authors uh, reported in the abstract section a statistically increased number of wood pigeons, caribou, which seems to have been the primary target of the research. However, in their analysis, they used an incorrect statistical, it's a linear statistical model, and so the study was doubly invalidated. Not only did they have a completely incomparable control group, which you could see from their own data, but the study was invalidated by they analyzed the data incorrectly. I mean, it's just a gross statistical error. But even so, it's in instructive to look at how they reported what have to be called spurious results. What they reported in the abstract section of that paper was that the Karoo population benefited from the use of Ariel 1080. They failed to even mention in the abstract section that that same erroneous, fallacious analysis that they believed you understand, they believed this analysis, also showed that there were decreased numbers of silver eyes and gray warblers. Now, I, I, it's, it's hard to imagine how you can choose one native species and say that was an important find that Aerial 1080 increased that, but it decreased the others. Well, of course, none of this is very meaningful because there's so many flaws in the study. We reanalyzed their data and uh, were able, to, well, we were unable to show 
much value in it at all. But the one thing that absolutely did stand out was that uh, minor birds' population had increased uh, relative pre and post and study to control areas uh, by 400%. In other words, the big benefit in that study was minor birds. This is consistent with the observation that feral species of birds may be doing at least as much harm to uh, native species by displacing them from their ecological niches. Uh, Doc is doing absolutely nothing about the feral birds. And the MPARA study is Doc's uh, flagship study of benefit to native species. In fact, the MPARA study illustrates most of Doc's uh, bad research and design habits. Historical controls, no randomization, uh, no replication, and several statistical errors. Uh, thus, even from the start, uh, it does not meet the minimal criteria for scientific validity. In one promotional brochure, Doc claims that there was a tenfold increase in Kokako population. There is no indication of that in the scientific literature. The scientific report shows that the population may have gone from 55 to 85, but it was not as a consequence of aerial 1080. The increase in population occurred three years after Aerial 1080 had been discontinued and was replaced by ground-based uh, control methods. Nonetheless, doc propaganda makes it seem as though Mapara was a triumph for Aerial 1080. This is an outrage in itself, and as I think everyone would agree, that this is gross misrepresentation. This distracts from what is probably a very useful observation, namely with species-specific ground-based trapping, you can actually help native species to recover. I got a, a license to use 1080 in 1960. I did a lot of the ori original research into th this poison, and I've used it virtually ever since. Most of my working life's been involved with it. I've done all the, all the groundwork, I've done the aerial operations, I've mixed the field solutions, I've done the whole lot. And it's been my repeated trips back to the same places all the time over many years, it's shown very clearly the effect it's having. And even when I was using it. So unless we do something about it, they are going to be responsible for wiping some of our native birds out. I've heard all the stories about the good nesting after they've done the drops and that, and most of it to me is rubbish. The Department of Conservation studiously ignore everyone but themselves. Doc claims that in 2010 they're going to start a study to, quotes, determine the effect of aerial 1080 on uh, native birds. Even assuming that they abandon all their bad study design habits, they are at least 17 or 18 years late. They have been dropping this substance into our environment, into our native forest, indiscriminately killing thousands, tens of thousands, and maybe hundreds of thousands of native birds for 17 years. And now they're telling us that they're going to go do a study? That we are, have no assurance will be at any better quality than the ones they've already done? 2019, when that study is finished, the game will be over. What they should do is to stop this practice now until they have legitimate proof of benefit uh, to native species. A 10-year study is about what it would take. Ten eighty was originally developed as an insecticide. However, researchers soon discovered that it killed practically every insect that ate it. Doc commissioned a study by their premier invertebrate uh, scientist, Mike Meads, to determine what the effect of uh, aerial 1080 drops was on invertebrate populations. Now, we all know what invertebrates are. They're the insects, the spiders, the bugs, the worms, everything that doesn't have a backbone. As you're probably aware, these are essential creatures in any environment. They're responsible for uh, decomposing leaf litter, they're responsible for breaking down animal carcasses. They're, uh, bugs are the backbone of the environment.
what the Mead study showed was that about 50%, 50% of invertebrates, if you looked at the overall populations among all species, uh, were killed uh, by aerial 1080. When Doc heard about this uh, result, they uh, immediately commissioned another study, but they analyzed the study in a way that virtually guaranteed would see no difference between the experimental and the control groups. When you fail to detect a difference, what you say is, well, we didn't detect a difference. You don't say it isn't true. You say we didn't detect a difference between the experimental and control. Maybe we have to do the study again. Meads was essentially forced out of his job at DSIR. Back in 1994, when I did my report, I suggested that it, we need long-term monitoring because we were just fiddling around, not really knowing what was killing what by what rate. Everybody agreed, long-term monitoring, yes, we must have long-term monitoring. It's now 2008, 14 years after I gave that recommendation, not one piece of long-term monitoring has been entered into at all. And so we are left with this virtual certainty or at least strong suspicion that a very important uh, element of our forest ecosystems are being systematically poisoned every three years. We discovered dust and fragments were enough to blow across an area and kill invertebrates down on the ground months afterwards. Has any studies been done on this? Not a one. I mean, Dot to this day continues to assert the, uh, what amounts to an oxymoron, that, uh, that somehow an insecticide, a substance invented as an insecticide, does not kill insects. Actually, this, is, though, this is beyond belief, actually, that they actually continue to assert in public that an insecticide does not kill insects on the basis of one badly analyzed study, this issue alone, if there were no other issue, if there were not all the dead birds, if there were not the lack of evidence of benefit, if there were not all the ecosystem uh, concerns, this one issue alone should be enough to just shut this thing down tomorrow. It's estimated that there are about 50,000 multicellular species, that is plants, animals and fungi, that are native to New Zealand but have not yet been formally described. So it's inconceivable to me that any individual or organisation can feel that there's sufficient known about 1080 to be applying it aerially. Fundamental tenet of ecology is that all living things live in equilibrium. When one disturbs the equilibrium by altering the population, of one or more, there will be changes that are unpredictable and unpredicted. And given the broad-based and crude structure of what Doc is doing in poisoning our forests with Aerial 1080, that's exactly what you'd expect. Murphy in 1998 did what is now a classical study. They looked at the diets of stoats in various rat control regimens. The results of this were startling. They surprised people around the world. With no pest control, rats constituted about 50% of uh, stoats' diets. And birds, including native birds, constituted about 6%. After pest control, however, stoats switched their diets to birds away from rats so that the uh, proportions almost inverted. The birds became 56% of the stoat diet and the rats became 16. Consider, for example, the Rusco study that was just published in 2008. The Rusco study compared rat populations after various forms of uh, pest control. The population of rats dropped immediately at the time of the pest control. But what they also found was that it very quickly rose, not to the pre-pest control level, but almost double, in fact, more than double of that pre-post control level by 18 months. And by 25 months, 
the population of rats had risen to almost three times the pre-rat control levels. It is reasonable to assume, and there are data to show, that the population of stoats tends to follow them. So then what happens? Doc comes in with another 1080 drop, as they say they intend to do ad infinitum, forever, every two to three years, drop 1080 into our forest ecosystems. Again, the population of uh, rats will drop off rapidly. And what are the stoats going to then switch their diet to? As Murphy showed, they're going to switch them to native birds. One of those birds is likely to be kiwi. The kiwi is New Zealand's national bird, our icon you might say. And yet, probably as many as 99% of New Zealanders have never seen one in the wild. A lot of that is due to the fact that they are mainly considered a nocturnal bird. However, on Stewart Island, it's possible to see one in daylight. Take the kiwi who's running around on the forest floor feeding, and he's got a long bill and he's got his whiskers up on the top end and what have you, he penetrates the soil and this is the kiwi's main feeding action is to penetrate the soil and go for all the invertebrates that it can reach. If it's soft, it doesn't matter what colour it is, if it's soft and edible, it's gone for if the kiwi gets his beak on it. Kiwi feed on soil invertebrates and so may be at risk from secondary poisoning. Al Morrison um, made a statement on public radio that we had the choice of either having 1080 and kiwis or no kiwis. Now that's a completely absurd statement. There is not even one stitch of evidence linking kiwi survival to the use of aerial 1080. And yet the, the, the director of DOC apparently believes that that's true. Some native species are more vulnerable because they are longer lived. And one example would be like the kiwi that might live for several decades. Then obviously they're being exposed to the toxin many times in their, in their lifetime. Kiwi are at risk from poison operations because they are known to have eaten cereal-based baits. In 1998, tested kiwi droppings returned a positive result for 1080 poison residue. Welcome to Stewart Island, Rakiuria as the Maori's named it. Talks are underway by the Department of Conservation to eradicate Stewart Island of mammal pests. One of the poisons considered for the job is similar to the one which recently killed 70 endangered native bats in the North Island. To eradicate pests from offshore islands, a poison known as Bradificum is often used aerially. If it is known that a species has eaten cereal-based baits containing Bradificum, that information is included in this report to indicate that the species may eat cereal-based 1080 baits. These are the results of a small number of the native birds killed in poisoning operations that have been recovered and tested and have returned a positive result for Bradificum poison residues. Kiwi are highlighted. Bradificum baits look like 1080 baits, so birds and other animals do not distinguish between the type of poison contained in the baits. Most birds killed in poisoning operations are never recovered. Kiwi chicks are more liable to feed on novel food items. With a short bill, chicks are restricted to feeding on surface dwelling invertebrates. Where kiwi chicks are present, they are exposed to poison baits and contaminated food sources in all aerial operations. We've seen uh, footage of kiwis pecking around amongst the stones, eating, eating uh, little kura, baby eels, the little worms and the little native snails. Now if they're contam contaminated, which they very likely are, what can be happening there, according to the data from put out by Toll Chemicals and our own scientists, that a tiny minute amount of 1080 side effects of that small amounts is reproduction toxin. New Zealand has two species of freshwater crayfish. 
Because they inhabit the small waterways that are poisoned in aerial poison operations, they are unavoidably contaminated, as are many other water-dwelling organisms. Kaura find 1080 pellets irresistible and will fight quite violently and persistently for them. These crustaceans provide an important food source for larger fish, eels and other native birds and waterfowl species. The amount of 1080 that it takes to kill an animal is generally called its lethal dose, lethal dose 50. And if you look at deer, uh, deer are quite susceptible uh, to 1080. Uh, it would kill over 100 deer per hectare. Well, generally, you only have a tenth of a deer per hectare. It's usually only one to 10 deer per square kilometre, which is 100 hectares. Well, lots of people have a positive attitude towards uh, deer because there was a study by a panel that looked at uh, the future management of deer chamois tar and pigs and 80% of the 4,000 people that answered that questionnaire said they felt that those animals were uh, a resource or mainly a resource. And 95% of them said their experience would be improved by meeting a deer in the backcountry. And that's a very significant part of the public uh, that has uh, positive feelings about these animals. There's a significant industry involved in the recreational hunting of deer and it's a traditional New Zealand uh, recreation that goes back over 100 years. So it's on a par with tramping, you know, so why would we want to wipe it out? Red deer have spread throughout New Zealand and make up the majority of the wild venison exported to Europe. Hunters go to great lengths to recover deer and their lifestyles are gruelling but exciting. Often, extraordinary amounts of willpower and determination were required to recover animals, but they were never wasted. The wild venison industry first started in the 1960s and grew rapidly. Initially, deer numbers were high, but after many years of hunting pressure, numbers reduced dramatically and remain low in most places to this day. New Zealand's wild venison is of extremely high quality and highly valued overseas. In the paper, Review of Non-Commercial Wild Food in New Zealand, feral deer were tested for 1080 residues. It states that two positive samples were reported in 1999. In April 2002, the wild venison industry was halted almost overnight due to a 1080 scare in meat intended for export. More than 16 tonnes had to be recalled by agricultural officials.
When animals are poisoned by 1080, they can take many hours to die, and so can travel long distances from where they were initially poisoned. In some cases, they can travel out of treated areas and into areas that never had 1080 applied. Look at that, right on the track. The young hind, by the look of it, that really disgusts me. What are, what are we supposed to do with this now? You call the people responsible and uh, ask them to uh, clean that up for you because this is, you know, it's private property and uh, the signs everywhere say you can't touch animals that have, uh, have died. So therefore, what do we do with this? The United States manufacturer's label clearly states that carcasses of animals poisoned by 1080 must be picked up and burned or buried deeply. Keep out of any body of water. It is a violation of state and federal law to use this product in a manner inconsistent with its labelling of the compound 1080. In New Zealand, carcasses of all animals killed by 1080 are left to decompose where they die, be that on land or in water. What does this say in here? Well, it's a justification, you know, of what they're doing, uh, supposedly to uh, to control TB, but it's well known that there is no TB in the Saskatchewan. We had to supply uh, 10 pig seeds to the council last year. There was absolutely no evidence of TB. None on possums, none on ferrets, and of course, none on stock. So, what's the point? The whole subject of TB control was attacked by a Treasury paper called Coughing Up for TB Control. The root cause of the problem is not the presence of possums, but rather their infection with TB, as is clear from areas like Taranaki, which have possums but are still TB free. And this suggests that TB was spread by transport on the back of trucks with infected animals. To date, our little operation has harvested and processed around about 350 tonnes of possum. And that equates to at least 300,000 possums. All those possums that have come through the factory, we've had not one showing any signs of tuberculosis, not one. And so the, the fear of tuberculosis, I think, is being exaggerated. We were recently at a meeting where the Animal Health Board declared that it's safe to eat TB affected meat and stated that some TB reactors are still sold to local markets, so some of us are eating it anyway. On the other hand, under no circumstances should any animal suspected of 1080 poisoning be eaten. Doc's not relinquishing its use of the poison just yet. We must continue with business as usual. This is a battle we're fighting on a daily basis. We need to monitor more so we know, you know, we're better armed to adapt our management, but uh, we can't afford to do nothing. I believe it was 1999, a scientist by the name of Bellingham, he looked at 25 years of forests across all of New Zealand and found that the forest health was not in any way affected by either possum control or uh, possum presence. Uh, in fact, he found a dynamic, uh, vibrant uh, set of ecosystems that waxed and waned, changed in density and composition over time with absolutely no correlation with um, possum control. Little evidence of predation by possums on vertebrates is obtained from analysis of gut contents of possums. No remains of vertebrates were found in almost 1900 possum stomachs from five studies. Dr. Roger Dungan and team found that possums can disperse nearly 20% of total seed rain and up to 75% for some species. This raises the possibility that possums may have positive benefits for ecological processes. The uh, increment of cost per hectare to control with ground-based bait stations as opposed to aerial 1080 was approximately 20% uh, of the total cost.
So for 20% of the $70 million, let's say 16 or $17 million, we can stop poisoning our forests. Who doesn't think it's worth it? I just come up for a project uh, working 4,100 hex. That's one man able to manage the trap line in 4,100 hex. The last survey showed us that we had 400 kiwi. That's 200 pair. And 50% of that is 100 kiwi come through every year because of the trapping. Now, if you've got survival with kiwi chicks like that every year, your whole ecosystem is being enhanced. That's the answer, trapping. For years we've been led to believe that 1080 doesn't kill native wildlife, doesn't get into waterways and doesn't kill insects. Of course now it's been proven that not only does it kill native wildlife, get into waterways and kill insects, it's also uptaken by plants. Now in fact in one study they even found being a systemic poison that it killed the aphids living on the plants. So I was part of a small group that did some research on uh, 1080 uh, regarding Rungawa plants. The study showed that um, plants took in 1080. We conducted a trial on puha, uh, which is collected out in the field all the time by Māori, and the tests uh, tested positive that puha does take up 1080 like any other plant. There's several types of puha, it just grows wild out in the bush uh, anywhere. And, and people go and collect them uh, to eat. And, and of course the other thing that we also got to be aware of is, is there's a whole lot of other uh, plants that Māori also use for vegetables, like the kōga there, the cabbage tree. Look, you have a look at the cabbage tree, the way the foliages are, it can capture 1080 pallets, no problems at all. And of course the part that is eaten is the, is the centre and you peel all the, all the green foliage off and you're left with a white centre like cauliflower and that's the part that you eat. So unless all those things are researched, you are never going to know. Native Māori foods and low chemical contaminants and combinations of them should be studied for watercress and eel and puha and any other native food that's consumed in large amounts. And we should be looking at what is happening to our, our children's brain function and disease susceptibility. This is what 1080 does to opossums. It almost did the same to little Natalie Turner. Well I saw it come out of her mouth, you know. I saw it actually was in her mouth and I scraped most of it out of her mouth yeah. and then I put my finger right down her throat. It went yeah. right down her throat and that's where I felt most of it, Door. down and still in her throat. Yeah. And when she vomited it. The Turners say Natalie picked up the 1080 pellets while they were visiting the tribal graveyard near Rotwaira. The pellets were part of a drop in the surrounding forest two weeks ago. Today, some were still there. There's no doubt 1080 pellets do kill opossums. The fear is they may kill other animals as well, even children. In the paper by McTaggart, a nine-year-old boy accidentally ate some rabbit bait that had been left in a barn on a farm and became very ill and was taken to hospital. The time he arrived in the hospital, he was having repeated seizures or fits and he had to go straight to an intensive care unit. He had uncontrolled movement of the muscles in his arms and legs for almost a month after he'd been poisoned. And while he was eventually able to recover a lot of movement in his arms and legs, he was still left with some permanent disability. So nine years after he'd taken the bait, he was still unable to walk without crutches and he was also left with some permanent mental retardation. Sometimes the proponents and supporters of 1080 go to extraordinary lengths to try and convince the public that this stuff is safe. 1080 is sodium monofluoroacetate. So the breakdown products of 1080 are salt and vinegar. 
pretty much, um, and it's the sort of thing you'd put on your crisps. To try and pretend that the constituents of the packet of, of salt and vinegar crisps are the same as, the, as one of the most lethal poisons in the world is breathtakingly cynical and evil and beyond belief. Like I said to you, the dust will not harm you. So we breathed it all in, it won't hurt any no of these security you. guys. No. No. no one's going to get hurt by no. breathing in 1080 powder. No. So the 1080 dust that we're all breathing in here won't hurt us. Harm. If you can prove that it does, come talk to me. The manufacturer's label states, when loading aircraft or working in windy conditions, wear goggles and a dust mask as protection against dust entering the eyes or mouth. Repeated oral exposure may cause reproductive or developmental damage. 1080 can be fatal if swallowed, inhaled or absorbed through the skin. Streams like this one have 1080 dropped directly into them as flight charts reveal. Water contamination has been a major issue for anti-1080 campaigners for many years. It is really of concern that Irma in its uh, reassessment of 1080 decided that uh, they were going to allow it to be put into public water supply areas and at present uh, the water supply area of Levin which is about 3,000 hectares uh, in the tower, western side of the Tower River Forest Park is going to have uh, over 10 tonnes of standard 1080 dropped into it and that has a killing power of, uh, based on the, on the lethal doses of about 60,000 humans. It seems to be a really irresponsible thing to do for a public agency to be putting that amount of poison into a water supply catchment. This is 3 News. Locals were shocked last night when they received notification their drinking water may be poisoned. Tried not to use any water, it was quite scary. Uh, a little bit worrying, so I didn't use my water all night. The council was forced to dump nearly 10 million litres of treated water from one of its two reservoirs last night after someone broke in, climbed down and left 1080 pallets on a control panel. Frankly, I think they're bloody idiots. The, uh, anyone who threatens to... Um, pollute a, a town water system or poison the town water system needs hanging. Local police say they will charge the culprits. It's a serious threat to the community because it, it is a poison and it is our main water supply and it's been treated as such. And so this is another double standard. Here we have authorities dumping 10 million litres of water because of a hint of 1080 and rightfully so these things are treated very seriously. However, the very same authorities are dumping thousands of tonnes of poison all across our forests and into rural water catchment areas and everything's meant to be okay. The point is, people don't want 1080 in their water supplies no matter how safe they tell us it is. In all the drops that take place around the country, and we see all the warning signs, there's absolutely no mention whatsoever about taking water out of the little streams. Now the track is just through there a few metres, and there's a lot of baits in this stream for instance. Now it's a heavy concentration, You're not, not only that you've got dead rat there, and on every drop zone you have the odd dead possums, possible dead pig, dead deer, lying in the streams, and they could take months to rot away. I mean surely, People should be told about the, the possibilities of contamination in the streams. You know, they should have at least have a choice of whether they want to drink the water or not, but they're not even told. Another thing that's quite concerning is the fact that all of these areas, while the drop happens from start to finish, they're totally open to the public. Some tourists going into the drop zone, if you like, on the road. Here's a carrot poison carrot. There's a couple of bits there but there's a big chunk here, it's been crushed by cars. Well we have seen them but we don't know what they're doing. Yeah. We were hoping they weren't going to drop it on us. <laughs> so in other words you could be walking around, choppers going over top, you could be hit by baits directly. When these drops take place, these streams are collecting greater amounts of bait than the land areas around them, simply because they act as a trough. So if you can imagine a stream with steep banks, like that, baits come out of the sky, hit the sides, and then bounce into the bottom and land in the streams. Now, 
As long as these drops are taking place and continuing to take place, contamination to the streams is unavoidable. There are 1080 drops happening at the moment this winter where the, the, the drops are happening in snow and they're sitting there in the snow. Of course, it's basically like putting something in the freezer. Of course, you put it in the freezer to keep it good, to stop it going off and it can persist for a long period of time, get into the waterways, and if that water temperature is only you know, 5 degrees Celsius, then the biodegradation is going to be very, very slow. Now, a risk assessment would need to look at the, the risks to those organisms that are either drinking that water or that are living in that water uh, at those temperatures and at those concentrations. By investigating what was happening in water, we discovered that 1080, the poison itself, is it's uptaken it doesn't just stick on the outside, the carrot tissues take it up. It imbibes the 1080 into the carrot. This happens in the water, any dead leaves, uh, any vegetation, uh, the animal life itself, any small animal life there too, also takes up the 1080. The animal life, of course, is, is, is often killed. It's taken up by these plants by the kura, by the mayfly that was under a rock just there, any of the animal life, whether it be trout or whatever, that's where your 1080 remains while they tell you that your waterway is completely clear. The uh, 1080 problem here, I believe, is in, especially in these small streams, is highly concentrated. The uh, crayfish eat the 1080 pellets, the eels eat the cura, the eels eat dead and dying um, fish and, and animals that fall into the stream, contamination there. Detection of 1080 in the muscle tissue of an eel nine days after it last consumed possum gut tissue containing residual 1080 suggests that the metabolism and excretion of sublethal doses of 1080 in longfin eels may be slower than in mammals and birds. The 2005 um, laboratory study, the average level of 1080 from an eel that had con consumed or eaten contaminated muscle was 17.4 parts per billion and the eels that had consumed gut, it was 30.6 parts per billion. Using Ferunda's um, acceptable drinking level of 0 0.6 parts per billion, that's uh, about 30 and 50 times more than that level. The food level, I think, would be enough to actually have epigenetic programming effects on a growing baby. An absence of evidence is not evidence of absence of a potentially um, serious lifelong threat. There's a major um, commercial eel fishery in New Zealand which is exported all over the world. High quality product that leaves the country but the um, potential for having that contaminated, especially this time of the year, the summer time of the year, when the eels are migrating, like I said before, it's not a matter of if they, f they pick up the contamination overseas, it's when. The New Zealand Food Safety Authority was asked whether they test eels destined for human consumption and export for 1080 residues. This is their reply. Due to the generally rapid breakdown of 1080 in the environment and dilution when 1080 hits water, any residue of 1080 in eels would be at such extremely low levels it would be undetectable. The New Zealand Food Safety Authority has therefore not undertaken such testing. Taking into account that 1080 persists for long periods of time in the environment, especially in winter, and that not only possums but larger animals like deer and pigs are decomposing in our streams, this response from the FSA just goes to show how our own authorities are not being fully informed of the dangers of using indiscriminate poisons like 1080. Our endemic eels, kura and birds are all being poisoned in aerial operations. The question that needs to be answered is, is it okay to sublethally and lethally poison multiple species while targeting another? There is cause for concern where carrot baits are used in aerial operations. Carrots retain the poison in their cellulose even after heavy rain or while submerged in water, so their toxicity can last long periods of time. I'm pretty sure carrot floats, pretty sure it floats. So what will happen is the, the carrots that land in the water get uh, drift down and end up in a little eddy somewhere. Let's have a look here, here, over here. 
This stream, as with most New Zealand streams, runs directly through a farm, and these baits can travel long distances down waterways and end up well away from where they were originally dropped, potentially coming in contact with animals they are not intended for. Back in 96, um, we lost six cows um, due to 1080 poisoning. Um, just wandering into the bush over here and um, picking up the baits and yeah, killing over. A couple of months ago, they did a 1080 drop um, in the Pura Forest here and um, we lost a, a cattle beast to 1080. Got the vet report done $700 later uh, and it confirmed um, yeah, it was definitely 1080 poisoning. Funny thing was, was when they were going to pay up, they asked to um, to write the account out as track maintenance, not as an animal um, actually dying of 1080. In regard to the compensation, um, basically we've lost 13 deer. When we're asked to put a, an invoice in for the for the deer, they actually want it marked down as stock food. Stock food, not they actually animals. They don't want to admit that they've killed animals. Um, that. To me, that's not honest. That, that, you know, if that's, they're trying to cover up our stock like that, then how, else, how many other thousands of stock losses have there been over the time that they're actually whitewashing? Well, this is where our 250 sheep were poisoned. We had to sign a confidentiality clause that we wouldn't divulge what had actually happened. And that was happening up and down the country. We had no idea. We, you tend to be so isolated in your little area and you don't realise what's going on throughout the rest of New Zealand. And it was only later, as, as we made investigations, discovered that this was happening to so many other people and that it was all being hushed up. Just some of the most picturesque country you can imagine up here. And it's all been dropped, aerial dropped, 1080 poison. Where they drop is, they come around the side of the hill here, just between me and the top of the ridge, but below the ridge. And they uh, run all the way along there. Now, what happened is when they were dropping this 1080, I was here and I watched the choppers. And they were on this side of that ridge, which we believe contaminated Phil Patterson's land and also and a stone throw is the milk and sheet, which is just there. What we have in this country now is an expanding dairy industry, and, and a lot of their runoffs are now pushing right back onto the edge of the bush, if not into the, into the fringes of the bush on these dairy runoffs. One aerial operation, one stick of 1080 poison, goes into those cows, goes into your milk, goes overseas. These are of huge concern. I've had 34 years of experience living and working right in the middle of 1080 drop zones. We've seen a lot of things happening out there that are unexplainable. Um, we've seen a lot of ill thrift in our farm stock, a lot of unexplained deaths. We've had sheep die with 1080, up to 160 the neighbours had. We've had deer die, we've had cattle die. All of these animals had been found in paddocks with traces of 1080 in them. In 1998, nine cows were poisoned by 1080 and their milk processed into milk powder. In September 2002, 40 tonnes of butter and 20 tonnes of the byproduct casein were held in Tikaka after a helicopter dumped 1080 pellets into water, supplying a group of dairy farms. The FSA were asked if dairy and meat products were tested for 1080 residue. Their response was, Targeted surveillance for 1080 and farmed animals, including cows and sheep, may be undertaken should the need be identified. However, such testing is an infrequent event and has never yielded a positive result. In respect to routine testing on dairy products, the answer is no. We promote pure water, our clean green image, our quality food products. Surely we should be testing all product from drop zone regions for 1080 residues, but we're not. We have got documented evidence of deer, cattle, 12 months after a 1080 drop with traces of 1080 in them. What about the rest of their paddock mates? Where have they gone? They've either been on sold or they've perhaps gone to the, or they have gone to the works. Have any of these other animals had traces of 1080 in them? Farm animals, there is really no restriction on moving within, within or nearby a 1080 area. While we were on the west coast, we filmed the JP who'd had 11 cattle killed by uh, the aerial dispersal of 1080, which had accidentally landed on his land. 
uh, three of those cattle died in the truck on their way to the abattoir. Now, if they'd survived half a dozen more hours, they could well have ended up in the European food chain. The other eight cattle we found scattered all over his farm, and they'd been dead for about six weeks, and they had mummified. Uh, the ones that were that had died in a uh, stream, there were four of them, um, were still intact, and even the eels that had tried to eat them had died. This will, at some stage, enter our food chain, if it hasn't already. And I strongly urge all farmers out there to seriously reconsider what's going on out there. This is the biggest biosecurity threat that I believe farmers have got, over and above anything else that can come into the country. The big problem we face is the spectre of 1080 in the product. I've had a, an order of 100 tonnes a year, possum meat, rejected by Japan after they saw a documentary on the spreading of 1080 round Mount Ruapehu. The advice I got from the Japanese, there was to be no discussion, they would not revisit the, the situation. When they knew that we were spreading 1080 over our Naheri, end of story. We out for a pheasant hunt on the third weekend of the duck season and yeah, after getting the permits, shot this pheasant in the forestry and when we got home, plucked it out and saw the greenness around the crop and opened it up to find it's full of 1080. What was the most surprising about getting a poisoned bird was the fact that it was still alive and the dog put it up and I shot it. Those are the dangerous parts of it, whether you know afterwards whether it's going to be in the bird or not. Or if I'd just taken the breast meats out of it, um, we might never have seen it. The Department of Conservation and the Animal Health Board are quick to dismiss people's concerns by pointing out that the chances of acute poisoning from drinking contaminated water or contaminated food products is low, and most of us would agree. Acute poisoning is how much it takes to kill you quickly. However, acute poisoning is not what people are concerned about. In 2007, over 200 of the world's foremost experts got together and the, gathered at the Faroes Islands for an international conference entitled uh, Fetal Programming and Developmental Toxicity. And basically they said it was a wake-up call for regulatory bodies to look at those age groups which are most vulnerable to chemical environmental exposures, um, which can actually affect them in those growing periods, the periods where there are critical windows of much harm being done in the womb, fetuses, embryos, um, newborns, and how an exposure here in this early time of life can lead to great harm and susceptibility to disease years or decades later. People claim that 1080 has been studied to death. Well, it's absolutely not true. It hasn't been studied to death. It's been, it's been very well studied in certain areas of its toxicology. But it's been very poorly studied in other areas. And some of these other areas are really important. And one of those is hormone disruption. We know that hormone disruptors can be effective in parts per trillion, way even below parts per billion. And one part per trillion would be the same as if you're making a gin and tonic. It'd be one drop of gin, and you'd have to then have 660 milk tankers full of tonic to dilute it to one part per trillion. And parts per trillion are enough to disrupt hormone systems. It would take 10,000 lakes the size of Taupo to dilute the annual drop of 1080 into New Zealand's forests to four parts per trillion. So where are the cancer-causing or carcinogenicity studies? There aren't any. We are the uh, reproductive studies, particularly focusing on female eggs. There aren't any. We are the developmental studies, early exposures to brain, um, immune system. There aren't any. We are the long-term chronic exposure studies, looking at mitochondrial DNA um, content and mutation rates. There aren't any. Uh, there's a lot of doubts about the substance. It's dangerous. Interestingly, with the, the studies that have been done on hormone disruption of 1080, um, the one that's been used by the Ministry of Health to set the safety standard in New Zealand was one of these studies which was like going through Wellington Harbour with a net with a mesh size as big as a house because it only looked for gross morphological defects. Looking at the design of that experiment, I would conclude that it's not possible to come to any conclusion about the hormone disrupting capabilities of that toxin 
using that design because it's just fundamentally flawed. Now in fact the, the design that was used for that experiment I wouldn't even pass that research in an undergrad level of environmental studies at Victoria University because it just wouldn't stack up. In December 2008, the Ministry of Health released the following statement. Studies show that 1080 can cause fetal skeletal malformation, cardiomyopathy, damage to the heart muscle and testicular effects reduction in sperm count in animals. To date, there are no known epidemiological studies that have been carried out in relation to 1080 and potential adverse health effects on humans. I think the question we have to ask is who do we value? Do we value pregnant females and their unborn children if it's a human or their unborn birds if it's a bird or whatever. I mean if we value these things and if we're concerned about them then we need to have a close look. In 2007 a government agency called IRMA carried out a review of the use of 1080 poison in New Zealand in which they accepted submissions and evidence from both sides of the argument. At that time we just completed our first documentary on the subject called A Shadow of Doubt. We submitted this along with many other contributors against the practice. However it appears that every issue against the continued use seems to have gone deliberately unnoticed or ignored. This is 3 News. The users of 1080, the Animal Health Board and the Department of Conservation have jointly applied for its use to be reassessed. There's a high degree of public interest in 1080, there's also updated uh, research and there's also an intention uh, by uh, Animal Health Board to, and DOC to, to keep using 1080. Security is tight, with Irma worried about protesters. Cameras, including our own, are banned from the actual hearings. It seemed to us, being a part of it, that the, that the process was wired from the beginning. For example, they pre-announced what their decision was going to be before they even held the public hearings. It provides for an open and objective public scrutiny of the risks and the rewards um, from using 1080. There was misrepresentation, verging on lies, there was huge errors of admission, there were all kinds of problems in the, in the submission. In fact, when we did our study, we found that there were 50% of pages of the submission, of the uh, Dr. Irma submission, that had serious errors. Despite all that, they just went right ahead and completely ignored it. The only biological scientist on the Irma committee was Richard Sadler. This was the same Richard Sadler who had invented the aerial 1080 program in the early 1990s to figure out a way to dispose of the $50 million bonus that they had gotten from Parliament to fight pests. Consider, for example, who else was on the committee. There was a professor of chemistry, there was a lawyer, there was somebody from the business school, and there was a politician. The chairman of the committee was a politician. And unfortunately, as the aerial drops, that also posed the biggest problems. Uh, Rob Furlong, the CEO of, uh, of IRMA, was an ex-employee of DOC. And in addition to that, DOC partially funds IRMA. <laughs> so, so what you've got here is this incredibly incestuous relationship. There was absolutely no way that the, you were going to come out with a uh, an honest appraisal. In our view, the IRMA process was a sham. Uh, what needs to be done is pretty clear. You need an independent scientific, scientific review, not one fox working in the hen house. We've requested an interview or some kind of comment from the Department of Conservation on five separate occasions. They've declined every time. However, they did finally make a comment after watching the premiere of this documentary. The Department of Conservation stated, The anti-1080 film does not raise fresh claims or evidence. And they close by saying, Basically, the Environmental Risk Management Authority has approved 1080 for use, it is safe to use, and DOC is going to use it. So where do we get our 1080 poison from? Well, it comes from a factory based in the United States called Tell Chemicals. If you see the bridge coming down with the cars coming down it, about where those cars are right now is where Toll Chemical is located. This is the road leading down to uh, Toll Chemicals. 
the interesting thing about this place is it's on a floodplain that signs uh, no more than uh, maybe 100 yards from uh, Tull Chemical. The small Tull Chemical building in Alabama is the only manufacturer of 1080 in the world. That is Tull Chemical. This is Tull Chemical's front entrance. Calhoun County property taxes indicate that it cost uh, $51,000 to build this structure. The interesting thing to me was that you can wreck the ecology of another country from a building in Oxford, Alabama that cost no more than $51,000 to build. And that's corporate headquarters there. There's a the number to call in case of emergency. So who's importing the 1080 into New Zealand? 1080 is imported into New Zealand by a company called Animal Control Products, which is owned by our government, of which the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Agriculture each represent 50% shareholdings. You know, there's a lot of contractors, a lot of government workers who are in a job because of the application and the management of 1080. And, you know, here they are fiercely defending it in the face of all of these reasons not to use it. They're so fiercely defending it and it's like, well, maybe they're just defending their bread and butter. Because you have the word conservation in the name of a bureaucracy, doesn't make it not a bureaucracy anymore. They threw $50 million in 1994 or whatever it was, Doc's way to control pests. And Doc, according to their own website, described the response inside of Doc as a lolly scramble. Well, that's precisely what it was. The system works pretty simply. You give someone a reason, an excuse to believe something, and then you give them a financial incentive, and they'll believe it. I mean, that's it. That's the end of the game. In 1987, the Department of Conservation claimed there were 70 million possums in New Zealand. Now, DOC and AHB state that after each aerial 1080 drop, they can reach up to 95% kill rate. Yet here we are 20 years later, after spending more than a billion dollars on possum control, and yet it's still stated that there's between 60 and 90 million possums in New Zealand. Now if that's the case, they've done absolutely nothing to reduce numbers. You see, the possum's just a hyped up, demonised thing to keep a hundred million dollar a year pest management industry running. So they've got to keep, this, keep this, the, the fear of the possum alive, the fear of the mammalian browse. And the way to do it is to have a villain that you can't beat. You don't defeat possums, you're going to have to fight them forever. That means 80 to 100 million dollars on the dock budget every year. Virtually every quotation we hear from Doc and virtually every quotation we hear from Doc's supporters, apologists, Forest and Bird Society, uh, the Green Party, mouth the same talking points. None of them seem to have gone back to the primary data to see what these uh, studies actually show. It is a profoundly human characteristic that once a human locks on to a particular idea and it sort of takes a faith-based status, which is most ideas for most people are anyway, it's you cannot undo them with evidence. It's just virtually no evidence that will cause people to change their minds. In my mind, the only way this thing is going to go away uh, is that if the international community gets involved, you know, like South Africa, apartheid, finally the whole world saying, you know, you guys are nuts. You got to stop this stuff. Uh, finally stopped it. But if, if the uh, white South Africans had been, had been left to themselves, you would still have apartheid in, uh, in South Africa. You'll, you'll still have Ariel 1080 going in New Zealand until something like that happens, at least in my mind. So what's the solution? Well, it's quite simple, really. We need to make the possum worth chasing. With a monetary incentive, great things are achieved. There are alternatives, but they will never be pursued while there is still the option to use 1080 poison. Up until now, proponents have instantly dismissed the true clean green solution, people power. This is because it would mean an end to their multi-million dollar 1080 poison industry. We cannot go on calling ourselves clean and green in this country when we're dropping thousands of tonnes of this deadly toxin all over our forests every year. Kaitiaki, it's a birthright responsibility that we have as Māori. The poison that's put on the environment and into our food chain is a concern because we live out of the environment as much as we can. And secondly, the wild native species which live within her, the environment. The best way that we can express ourselves as Māori 
is through the haka. Since IRMA approved the continued use of Aerial 1080 in New Zealand, the quantities released into our environment have increased. We drop over four tonnes of pure 1080 every year into our forests and national parks. We inflict suffering and death upon thousands of wild and domestic animals, native and non-native, and all this takes place conveniently concealed behind the walls of our forests. Miles Nakahara, the Forest and Wildlife Branch Manager on the island of Hawaii, when discussing our 1080 practice here in New Zealand stated, you will lose the very thing you are trying to save. This documentary is dedicated to Mike Meads, who put scientific truth and his beloved invertebrates ahead of his career by standing up against Aerial 1080 when no one else would. saw the sun, the Lord lay down to rest a while, so pleased with what he'd done. And of all the creatures that were made, he loved humankind the best. And so he placed into our hands the fate of all the rest. And all these things are given to you to keep and to protect. From the greatest of the big blue whale to the tiniest insect. To rule with love and kindness, the weak, the wild, the strong, and treat my creatures gently, only you know right from wrong. But man was so conceited that he couldn't see the work of all the other creatures who roamed this lovely earth. One by one we hunted them for food and sport and greed, and one by one they disappeared. Each species and each breed And all these things I give to you To keep and to protect From the greatest of the big blue whale To the tiniest insect To rule with love and kindness The weak, the wild, the strong And treat my creatures gently Only you know right from wrong Many years have passed, the Lord came back to see The earth and his creations that he left so fine and free Ah, but where are all my silver streams, the forest dark and green It was only dust and desert for humankind to be And all these things I give to you to keep and to protect from the greatest of the big blue whale to the tiniest insect To rule with love and kindness, the weak, the wild, the strong And treat my creatures gently, only you know right from wrong Where are all my animals, the hippo and the whale And the fish that fell the oceans before your ship set sail The lion and the tiger and the elephant so tall Oh, I left you as the keeper Do you not recall? And all these things I gave to you To 
keep and to protect From the greatest of the big blue whale to the tiniest insect To rule with love and kindness, the weak, the wild, the strong And treat my creatures gently, only you know right from wrong I treat my creatures gently, only you know 